chapter 9, we studied techniques used to control microbial growth in the environment. It is very important for students to be able to properly utilize terminology related to controlling microbial growth. Students should be able to properly define each of the terms seen in Table 9.1 and should be able to recognize examples. Students need to be able to compare microorganisms in regards to their relative susceptibilities to antimicrobial techniques. Figure 9.2 on page 262 of your text illustrates the relative susceptibilities of microbes to antimicrobial agents. On the same page, you will find the terms high-level germicide, intermediate-level germicide, and low-level germicide. You will need to provide a definition of each and describe what each level would be used to accomplish. Students studied both physical and chemical methods of control. It is important to provide a description of each technique and what level of microbial control is accomplished with each technique. Table 9.4 summarizes the physical methods of microbial control, while Table 9.5 summarizes the chemical methods of microbial control. Chapter 10 addressed the use of antimicrobial drugs to control microbial growth in the body. You will need to define selective toxicity and recognize which mechanisms of action for antimicrobial agents are the most selectively toxic. You should recognize the mechanisms of action of antimicrobial drugs. Figure 10.2 and your chart and angel from Chapter 10 provide summaries of this topic. Students should be able to define narrow spectrum drug, broad spectrum drug, and superinfection. Students will need to properly define antimicrobial resistance and recognize the cellular techniques through which antimicrobial resistance is acquired. You can find important information pertaining to this topic on pages 297 through 299 of your textbook. You will also need to be able to recognize what human activities contribute to the growing problem of antimicrobial resistance and what activities can be used to retard the development of resistance. In Chapter 13, we explored the structure and replication of viruses and discussed prions. You should be able to describe the characteristics, structure, and replication of viruses. Table 13.1 compares some of the characteristics of viruses with cells. You also need to be able to differentiate between the lytic and lysogenic viral replication of bacteriophages and recognize important details regarding the steps of animal virus replication. Table 13.4 provides a comparison of bacteriophage and animal virus replication. You will need to define prion and describe what kind of diseases are caused by prions. You will find information regarding prions on page 399. In Chapter 14, we examined important concepts related to infection, infectious disease, and epidemiology. You will need to be able to define normal flora and recognize how our normal flora are acquired. Students should define reservoir and recognize different types of reservoirs for disease, including human, animal, and non-living reservoirs. Define zoonosis and recognize groups of individuals more likely to contract zoonotic diseases. Students should be able to define infection, disease, sign, and symptom. Table 14.5 displays some examples of signs and symptoms. Students should be able to identify the portals of entry employed by pathogens to gain access into the body. Figure 14.3 illustrates the portals of entry. Students will need to be able to recognize the importance of adhesion factors in infection and describe other virulence factors used by pathogens. Figure 14.9 illustrates some of the virulence factors employed by pathogens. You will need to be able to define vector and differentiate between biological vectors and mechanical vectors. Table 1410 provides some examples of biological and mechanical vectors, and Table 1411 provides summaries of important terminology regarding modes of disease transmission. Students will need to differentiate between endemic, sporadic, epidemic, and pandemic. Figure 14.6 illustrates each of the different terms used for the occurrence of disease in a population. In Chapter 15, we investigated the components of the innate immune system. Students need to be able to differentiate between the three lines of defense and recognize which lines of defense and their components are part of innate immunity and which are part of the adaptive immunity. 
Students need to list and describe the components of the first line of defense and second line of defense. Table 15.6 summarizes the components of both the first and second lines of defense. Chapter 16 addressed the components and function of adaptive immunity. Students should define antigen and recognize how antigens are processed and presented to cells of the third line of defense. You should differentiate between numeral and cell-mediated immunity. You will need to recognize which cells are employed in each and how the cells are responding. For example, numeral immunity, also known as antibody-mediated immunity, is the function of the B cell which, when stimulated by an antigen, differentiates into memory cells and plasma cells. Plasma cells then produce antibodies which work in a variety of ways to assist in the destruction of the pathogen. Work through both humoral and cell-mediated immunity and summarize them in your own words. This greatly helps students to be able to remember the components and their functions. Students should be able to differentiate between the functions of the five classes of antibodies, IgG, IgM, IgA, IgE, and IgD. You can see page 471 and 473 in your textbook for more information on the five classes. Finally, you will need to be able to differentiate between the types of acquired immunity and provide examples of each. Table 16.4 summarizes the types of acquired immunity. In Chapter 17, we focused on vaccination, learning the types of vaccines and what they are used for. You should be able to describe the purpose of vaccination and distinguish between attenuated vaccines and inactivated vaccines. Be able to recognize advantages of each and disadvantages or risk associated with each type of vaccine. Pages 496 and 497 of your textbook address the two vaccines. Every semester, I have students ask the same question. Mrs. Smith, where do I begin? I'm going to provide some advice in preparing for the exam. I would begin by reading the chapter summaries. If something appears unfamiliar, that would be the time to go back into the chapter and reread those sections. Don't attempt to reread the entire book at this point in time. After reading the chapter summaries, try out some practice questions. You have several sources from which you can look at questions. You can use the questions at the end of the chapter, questions from the e-study area in Mastering Microbiology, or use the Dynamic Study Module application in Mastering Microbiology. I would advise that you try not to overwhelm yourself. Remember, this course continued to build on the same concepts in each unit. So at this point, try pulling all of the units together for a bigger picture. Finally, I would suggest that you don't cram the knot before. Get some rest, and on the morning of the test, if you're in the morning group, don't rely solely on caffeine to get you through. Have a good breakfast. If you're in the night class, don't consume a lot of the candy before you come to class. Find something healthy like some fruit or some cheese to snack on before you take the test. And then don't forget that you need to breathe when you're taking the test. Your brain cells need the oxygen. You will have plenty of time to complete the test, so don't worry about watching the clock on the day of the exam. I wish all of you the best in preparing for your final exam.